Okay, yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay, uh, hello, uh, my name is Ali. Uh, I'm Libyan, I'm uh, 22 years old. Um, uh, I graduate uh, just this year. And uh, I'm talking on here on the, on the life uh, when I was younger before the war, which is like now it's almost half of my life after the war and before the war. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to give the perspective of how Libya lived before NATO intervention and post NATO intervention in Libya. Yeah, awesome. So if you want to get started, my main topic, as you said, is, is pretty much we can start chronologically with how life was like before NATO intervened, um, before Gaddafi was overthrown, and then we can move chronologically from there. Uh, uh, yeah, but I, I want to just add a, add a, a time period, even before mm -hmm. Gaddafi, so, again, so people can get the whole perspective of how mm -hmm. Libya was and how Libya changed uh, when Gaddafi ruled, because there is going to be a connection between uh, the post-NATO and before NATO, also before Gaddafi uh, uh, coming in power. Uh, okay, from uh, from what I have uh, I've heard from my parents and their parents and uh, about uh, Libya before uh, Gaddafi, uh, uh, before uh, the revolution in 1968, uh, uh, Libya had like 80% of people living under poverty. Uh, there was no education, there was no healthcare, there was no electricity in vast majority uh, of cities in Libya. Uh, 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 even the city I live in now, which is a Mediterranean city uh, called Sirte, is the last city uh, where Gaddafi was in before he uh, they assassinated him by NATO. Uh, uh, and mostly vast educated people, vastly poor people, and uh, even they they already have had oil. Uh, King Idris before uh, was his name before Gaddafi took a, he was in power. Uh, he was uh, uh, a UK, US, uh, Italy, France puppet. It was just the king and figure not ruling anything in the government, not doing anything. Even you can find the documents about uh, the prime minister at that time saying like he was just the figure, not even a, a ruler in any kind of way. Uh, and Libyans lived through war, lived through colonization by the Italians, the fascists, then World War II, then uh, uh, appointing Idris as a king by the UK and the West. Uh, the oil production was started from 1958 till 1969, uh, and people haven't seen any progress from the, the colonization era from the, the fascist uh, Italians. Uh, when you, uh, for the story that even Gaddafi himself, uh, before the revolution for uh, the 4,000 days of uh, leading to the revolution, he just studied primary school in uh, the, the city of Sebha, which is uh, 70 kilometers away from the Mediterranean in the south, which is uh, basically desert in that way. But you can In that city, you can just study primary school. You can't go, you can't go any further because there's no available schools at that time. You have to go 700 kilometers to the city of Masrata, which is in the Mediterranean, just to finish your uh, basic school education then go to high school before he joined the military and this city where I live in was was just like mostly desert people was uh, people were living in tents they were just tribal tribal really tribal not educated there may be two or three percent in the city where they uh, they were educated or even had a little bit of money the rest were uh, poor sick uh, living by the aids of the uh, the UN uh, until until the revolution and the revolution happened. Uh, let's talk about the first period of the revolution uh, from 1969 to say uh, 1977 before uh, declaring the third world theory and the power of people and the 
a rule of people and the Jamahiriya and everything. <laughs> uh, uh, the country shifted uh, in the vast of just seven years more than, than it did like in 40 years. <laughs> like uh, uh, a major road construction begun, major housing construction begun, whole cities were built up. Because uh, I don't think a lot of people know how Libya, how big it is, <laughs> like uh, geographically wise. They don't know how really vast and big it is. And you need a lot of resources. You need a really good, good administration to build like cities out of nothing. And this, and the just seven, first seven years, uh, there was housing for every Libyan at that time. And I think the population at that time in the in the 1970s uh, was about 2 million to 3 million, I think. I'm not really sure, but the whole cities were built up. Uh, you, can, you can go in Libya and every city, you see the projects from the 70s and the 80s, people still living in it. Uh, it was a really good time uh, at that point where Libyans were seeing progress in front of them, especially in Tripoli, the capital, because Tripoli in the capital, there were slums, like even, uh, uh, and the, the the funny thing is like uh, the Italians, the France, uh, and the Americans were in the Wales. The Wales based the most the most big uh, the the biggest U.S. base outside of the U.S. in North Africa is the Wales base at that time. Uh, they were living better than eighty percent uh, of Libyans at that time. Uh, and Libyans at that time were living in slum, slums in Tripoli. Uh, there were areas you can't go as a Libyan, you can't go into. It's only for foreigners, only for the families of the uh, US uh, base workers or the French or the Italians who live there. Uh, when people saw this, people were cheering for it every down the street. There were really, at that time, I think there was like a really passionate phase of revolution. Uh, especially with uh, Jamal Abdel Nasser, like in Egypt, and uh, and uh, and the uh, and the West, and the uh, and Latin America, there was like a really high sense of revolution between the, the between the people because they were going every day calling for the union of the Arab, uh, the union with Egypt, uh, and Gaddafi was really inspired by Jamal Abdel Nasser, like he was really like seen him as as a father figure. Uh, if, I can, if we can say that as a father in a revolution figure. And uh, at that time from 1969 to 77, it was like a whole big scale of change happened uh, at, at that time. Uh, uh, if I can continue, if we have a question in that, uh, in that period. Uh, okay, uh, uh, let's talk after 1977. I'm not really uh, that informed of the political ideology of the, the like uh we're we're informed in the basics of, of it like the power of the people but uh, and i can't say it mostly in english i know it in arabic and i can say it uh, mostly in english but we know in that time uh gaddafi had a had a passion about Karl marx about communism and socialism and thing but he wanted to create a new system he saw he saw them i don't know why but he saw them as uh, uh, as these these uh, 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 these ways of ruling are not going to be efficient for our community as a, as a, as a society is full of tribalism that controls in every aspect in every aspect we're going to go to that to the the post NATO era how tribalism uh, going to affect in every uh, uh, in every economical political aspect of Libya so. Uh, he created this uh, this idea of the power of the people, of uh, converses of the people everywhere in every city, town, village. And when you're like you're in a village, uh, and you can say your opinion about the prices of goods and farmers, and you, uh, they can uh, claim their right in the smallest village in Libya, and it can go back to the central. Uh, central government in Tripoli, and they can control the prices, they can control what they need and what, uh, what they don't. Um, so yeah, people were excited to experiment it and, uh, and do it. 
even I, I have my opinions on it, but like I think it's, it was the best way of ruling that worked at that time, exactly. And, uh, and Gaddafi said, even Gaddafi said in, in, in one of his uh, speeches that, uh, that uh, the social, uh, the social, uh, the social Libyan uh, uh, system is not going to work now. It's not going to work perfect now at that time, exactly, because you're going to have stages. You're going to have the stages where people are accepting it, learning it. Then you have a stage of people neglect, neglecting that power authority of the people. Then you are going to have chaos, which is leads to people like thinking that we had something going on perfectly. So we need to go back to it. And that the four stages, people really practicing the power of people, uh, the social system of Libya, and really like uh, do it step by step without any, no intervention because Gaddafi had a lot of interventions in these kind of ideas because people were, uh, people were a lot of people were uh, using that, that system for their own benefit. Uh, and then we're going to go to the 80s. Uh, then we're going to go to a big part of Libyan uh, thinking now. Even you talk to every Libyan, you have the idea that time of sanctions. That time of sanctions. Uh, so Libya got sanctions because uh, 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 of the West trying to uh, uh, stop it from uh, uh, supporting uh, liberation groups all over the world. Uh, uh, start uh, stopping it from calling for union uh, uh, with Egypt, Syria, Algeria, the Arab League, then going to Africa, then going to Latin America. And they staged the Lockerbie case, which is 100% uh, 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 false because they used it against us. Particularly now we have documents saying that Libya wasn't involved in it and now Iran is. And uh, they just released it that I've read it uh, a year or two years ago that they said, oh, the, the, the bigger flame uh, is Iran, not Libya. Um, you're going to use you're going to use any case in that uh, that matter against the country when they it fits them. <sighs> oh, just one minute. So, yeah, uh, um, life under sanctions. Uh, uh, and that's time. Uh, Libyans had a hard time uh, living under sections, but the government, I think, in that time in Gaddafi, tried to do its best to help that situation. Not like a lot of people affected. Uh, uh, Libya shifted to a more production phase. We started uh, start production, our own food, our own, uh, uh, our own uh, goods, our own. Uh, vegetables our own meat like farmers they were given the uh, they were given um, they were given like uh, farms uh, there was a project uh, uh, for farmers when you're gonna the, the government is gonna give you land it's gonna give you the the material to grow the land and you're gonna take care of it then you're gonna produce and share it to the society you live in the community uh, you live in and that time, a lot of factories start working inside of Libya, even even um, technology wise, TVs, cell phones. We had uh, we had uh, two major factories in Benghazi and Tripoli, the two major cities in Libya, were producing televisions and uh, cell phones at that time. So I don't think I don't think compared to now that uh, Libya is really know what sanctions it, uh, are like exactly, because the government handled it so well, even though. What, there was a long lines of people waiting for the public goods with uh, supported cost. Uh, prices never changed. Even the dollar changed for the Libyan currency, but prices never changed for the uh, the wage of the uh, the regular uh, Libyan family. And then under sections, uh, um, uh, uh, I think Libya, uh, I think Gaddafi. Which, uh, we're going to talk about. Uh, Gaddafi's perspective of a union. During after he came in power, his main goal was the Arab, the Arab Union. From the 1969 to take Arab power, Jamal Abdel Nasser, he was trying to call for Arab Union until I think after the sanctions, because I think it, it failed because there was so many 
governments that were uh, supported by the West, controlled by the West, it was like a failed cause. He tried his best. He tried to to call them in the Arab League. He tried to uh, tell them. He, he offered to Tunisia at that time, uh, which was uh, the president at that time. Like He said, you can take our Libyan oil. Take our Libyan oil. We just want a union. We just want to uh, live under a one uh, uh, economical uh, economical uh, party, like as a union, because I think it's important uh, for Libya to be under a union, because you can't shift from that stage where you're in a country 100% depending on oil uh, as an income to a, a more uh, uh, as a country that can produce to the vast uh, vast market. You don't have the market. The market is controlled by the West. Uh, they're the ones who they are telling you what the prices is, what the goods are. They're going to control that market for you. So he was trying to create that stage from Libya can go from a single country, depending on oil, to a more productive country that can mass produce this, uh, like to a large market as the Arab Arab uh, Union. But unfortunately, he called it for for more than 20 years and it failed every time because uh, uh, the governments at, at that time and even now uh, were vastly controlled by the West. Uh, their, their governments, the oil prices was vastly controlled by the West. Even he tried uh, uh, in Libya, uh, the oil prices went down so low in the 80s, uh, if I can remember, because the US uh, uh, ordered Saudi Arabia to mass produce oil so the dry prices can go down and that would affect uh, Libyans vastly. So uh, in that time, I think then uh, in the 90s, after after uh, uh, the, uh, the sanctions were lifted in the end of the 90s, but in the 90s, uh, Gaddafi was going to the goal of the African Union because the man was trying for 20 years that I go to the Arab League, uh, talking to them, making arrangements, get, uh, saying to them, "Take our oil. We don't need it. We just wanna, we just wanna create the union so we can fight for ourselves. We can fight. We can defend ourselves. We have." Uh, in one of his speeches, he said, "We have more than 10, 10 million soldiers as a union. We have more than five hundred thousand uh, artillery of military in our uh, if we did a union." But they never listened. Uh, they never, they always call them, uh, they always call them crazy in their media. Uh, even the Saudis in the 80s called him, uh, called him an infidel uh, who doesn't believe in God. When he's like, uh, hello? Uh, uh, they called him an infidel who doesn't believe in God. Uh, it was uh, so, so funny at that time. Uh, uh, he was, uh, 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 so yeah, oh, we're talking about, uh, yeah, then he switched to the African Union. Uh, they declared uh, the startup of the African Union here in my city, CERT, in 1999. Uh, uh, it was, I think, the big shift after the sanctions were lifted was going on uh, the African Union path because it was the more realist, the, the more the most like successful, I think, in in his mind at that time, even for Libyans, Libyans were so tired of uh, like trying to to feel that Arab connection with others. We have the connection to people. We have the connection of Palestine. Uh, that big connection. That's it's our cause. We gotta fight for it. We gotta do it. But we always saw these government, other governments, living near near Palestine borders with them. And they can't, they're not doing nothing. And we as Libyans, we were like uh, setting, uh, setting military camps, in, uh, mili uh, military camps in Tripoli, here in Sirt, in Benghazi. Well, we saw uh, a lot of people studied uh, with us, or Palestinians, Syrians, Yemenis, Algerians, Tunisians. We never felt that we we're different from them. We always had that spirit of like, we have a, a like a compass that leads us in this uh, it's Palestine to the uh, liberation of Palestine. 
but unfortunately that didn't happen so yeah from uh, the 2000s uh Gaddafi, i think switched the uh, switch to the african union trying to stay uh, established the african union what was established here from search from the wagadugu uh conference center uh and here in cert uh and that and that way we're going from the 2000s to the 2010 post-NATO uh, post NATO intervention. Uh, I'm going to talk about how people, how people now lived after sanctions, because they saw the shift, big shift from this uh, 1969 to the 17, then the 80s and 90s under sanctions. Uh, now Libyans, uh, most of them were fed up. I'm going to, because I'm going to be objective here. I'm going to say what the cons and the, the bros were. Okay, after the 2000s, mostly Libyans were tired of politics. We're tired. Uh, we're tired. Like, why are we going on Africa now? Why are we were going to the Arab League? We just want, we want to focus on ourselves. We want to build our country. We want to, oh, we're seeing other countries build up. We're seeing other countries uh, like, uh, uh, go up higher and there's buildings, tall buildings and stuff like that. It was, it was like a funny idea, but it was asked for the people that they lived under sanctions for more, more than 10 years. They wanted the, they wanted better. Uh, so yeah. And after the, the 2000, the country, the country was going open, uh, to the market, to the European market it was going, uh, like, uh, uh, open a little bit for, for, uh, for the West. Uh, 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 the big role of it was Saif al Islam. Uh, Gaddafi's uh, son was he was uh, at that time uh, more uh, lib uh, liberal than his father. He, he wanted to make peace with the West. He wanted to to change the idea that the West is always the enemy and stuff like that. And lot and, and a lot of uh, young Libyans followed him in that way. They wanted they wanted they, they wanted housing. They wanted they wanted to get married, they want an income because, because they saw all these rich oil countries uh, and seeing how they live and comparing it to us without knowing the context. That's the thing. The, the thing, the big fail was the media because they never, or I don't think if it's the education system or the media, because they never educated people <laughs> about, about, What's the context is why we went, why we went for the Arab League, why we're supporting the Palestinian cause, why we're going to Latin America, why we're going to Africa, because they didn't know that at that time. I think is really one of the the mistakes that uh, that the the government at, uh, at that time did, because they didn't educate people in that way. Uh, they just saw they just saw old people and conferences in the country just speaking nonsense they didn't understand because we're talking about because <clears throat> after the 2000s we're talking about a new generation we're not talking about the, the generation we was before when i said they were more rev revolutionary they lived in poverty then they saw the revolution then you saw uh, life changed He's the people who saw in themselves, saw in front of them how life changed and stuff, and they were heartful with that, uh, with that, uh, with the cause. But for the the more uh, young Libyans at that time, they didn't they didn't understand that. They were like, "Why we're we going to this? Why we're we doing that? Why we're uh, why we're we going to do these different countries? Why we're why we are enemies to the West? Why why we're not like the." Saudi Arabia, why we're not like UAE, why we're not like Kuwait and uh, these countries. So yeah, demand for more uh, liberalism, more open to the market. Uh, yeah, I was going uh, uh, with the Safe Little Stamp project, Libya Tomorrow, it's called like that. And it gathered a lot of uh, Libyans because it was vastly infrastructure project. Uh, it was uh, it was uh, two hundred billion dollars for just infrastructure. That's th that just without the housing and the improvement of, of uh, healthcare, education system, and things like that. 
So yeah, in that time, uh, and uh, and uh, I was talking about Gaddafi now. He he switched to Africa because he saw the opportunity of how much influence we can do. But I th- because I think I think after the the war with Chad in the in the eighties and how the French were influencing that war, the U.S. and uh, also Saudi Arabia and Iraq at that time, and when Saddam Hussein was in their side. Uh, how they influenced that war when they're trying to build French bases in the borders with Libya and how it was a, a big threat to national security for Libyans. I think in that time, uh, Gaddafi saw the threat that's coming from Africa. So we need to focus our our effort to Africa. So we start uh, the support for African liberation groups, the start uh, like start the support of people like Thomas Sankara and other people I can uh, I can't remember their names exactly but like uh, yeah it, it uh, we're starting to change we're supporting the change of regimes what that were uh, were uh, like controlled by the west to the uh, to our uh, allies so so that was the big step against the west that was going to threaten them Actually, when when people saw that Libya was becoming more uh, liberal, actually politically it was becoming more aggressive towards Africa, the the huge resource market for the West, the huge colonization pace for the West, for hundreds and hundreds of years, and you threatened them on that on that continent. So yeah, Libya was going all in politically and uh, economically influencing the continent in different ways and different ways so yeah uh in that time uh 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 libya had, had a big role had a big plans that had big plans of the african union the african union currency uh the major economical zone which libya was going to be on the mediterranean leading the way to uh, leading the way from the south of Libya to other roads to Africa to create that huge market where we're, uh, where we're uh, hoping for. Because in, that, in a country like Libya, where was a tribalism uh, controlled by it. Can't change the status of the society when it's tribalism. <laughs> because they're dependent uh, on oil as a people. So you have to make them uh, joining in the vast majority of a society where it's uh, economically producing, like uh, like uh, the Soviet Union at that time, maybe you can call it. Uh, when you have that major uh, economic zone, people can work at that time and more uh, be blended in a bigger society. They can be, tri- uh, they, it won't be, tribalism won't, won't affect them that much. Uh, so yeah, uh, from 2000, uh, I think uh, seven, eight, uh, nine, and ten, uh, 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 U.S. oil companies returned to Libya under certain uh, uh, rules. French oil companies also returned to Libya under a, a, a percentage uh, uh, demanded by the government. So everyone saw that Libya is going more. Uh, liberal, uh, liberal in that way, and becoming more friendly uh, with the West. We saw in two, 2009, we saw the historical uh, Gaddafi appearance in Italy uh, with uh, Berlusconi, uh, where, where he did the most, I think the most uh, uh, historical movement ever, because he handed out the, the plane to Italy, having in his uh, in his uh, chest, the picture of Omar Mokhtar, uh, the Libyan symbol against the colonization. And we saw also Perlusconi kissing his hand, which is a, was like a big blow for, for, the, for the West. Because he said it, Gaddafi said it in the speech. He said, he said uh, I'm not worried uh, to the Arab League. Uh, he said, I'm not worried about you guys seeing me and what I do. I'm worried about the other ones seeing what I do because they know how they don't they don't forget the history the West doesn't forget the history so when you go to a, to Italy having the Omar Mokhtar in your chest 
the symbol of fighting colonization. And Berlusconi, the prime minister of European country and European Union, kissing your hand that, that, that influence a lot of things because there is going to be certain people going to watch this and going to analyze it. Uh, and uh, Italy, uh, in that time, 2009, came to the deal of the, uh, uh, the apology to Libya. I think it's, it's a, well, one of the more, I think it's one of the first to apologization. And I think France did Italy. Uh, Al killed a million uh, Algerian. Algerians are still fighting for that. Uh, apology, even declaring just that we colonized you, we killed a million Algerian, and they, they have their skulls in France, in museums, and they not going to admit it was a massacre, a huge massacre, like like the massacre in World War II. But Italy, uh, uh, apology was uh, was a big proud for Libyans was like an honor earned. We all, uh, we all felt uh, honored at that time. Uh, I, was, I was a lot, I was younger, I'm, I'm gonna say I was uh, uh, young, I didn't understand, but I saw it in TV and I saw my mom and my dad like really happy and cheering in, in our living room. Uh, and I didn't understand the reason, but now I understand. After the war in NATO, I understood why they were cheering for it. Because for them, that for them it was their dignity going higher, seeing this, seeing like how the history changed, how they were born in the 60s, how their childhood was, then the revolution, and now seeing the uh, this colonization power that destroyed Libya and uh, killed half killed the half of the, the, the population of Libyans at that time, half of the population of Libyans, saying it. Uh, apologizing to their leader that uh, uh, that we uh, who we love most dearly, and uh, Italy uh, announced they're gonna give Libya two hundred uh, uh, billion dollars for uh, uh, building a road for, between uh, the West and the East and uh, other infrastructure projects. So at that time in two thousand ten, uh, I think it was. The more the most prospect uh, prosperous times uh, time for Libyans because they were seeing infrastructure projects going on companies big companies coming from Turkey China uh, coming from Europe we're seeing uh, we're seeing Italy going to make projects for infrastructure uh, uh, for Libya building roads and stuff like that because in that time the time period when we were under sanctions. We missed a lot of things that was going on. We had the, the roads were not being updated, uh, were not being rebuilt. The, the, uh, the, uh, the population was going up. We didn't have uh, much housing for them. So we, ha we had a crisis. Uh, we had a, a housing crisis and a point and also a wage crisis because people demands were, were more and more needed, seeing, seeing other countries, seeing other Gulf countries, I don't know, the comparison was in that time, I don't think it was, I think it was intentional by uh, UAE at that time. So, you know, we want to be like, a, because uh, one of the sayings, uh, the funny sayings they were uh, saying during the revolution, that uh, the so-called revolution, uh, saying we want to be like Dubai. They were just like saying, we well, want to be like Dubai, we just want to be like Dubai. When, when you compare Dubai to, uh, or UAE to Libya, to the to the how spacious it is, how geographically big it is, and you can go in Libya, uh, and that before post uh, post NATO war, you can go from uh, the north to a small village in the in the in the south, where there is like three thousand four thousand living in that small village, and you have you have in that village a school, a clinic, uh, and you have a. Uh, and you have uh, a library. We ha they have electricity, and they, all, all their goods coming with uh, prices supported by the government. Uh, see, you got now. You're gonna compare because Libyans after the war know all about this. They they know all all about how the government was supporting them, them 
in, the, in these financial ways. Uh, so yeah, in 2000, uh, 2011. So uh, I'm gonna go to the stage of 2011, and that's how, uh, at, uh, at that time I was uh, I was 12, 12 uh, uh, year old, and but I was I was I was I was quite smart. I was going to, to uh, into the internet, and I was uh, I was uh, uh, more open minded to see how life works in in that kind of way. And uh, uh, let's go to the 14th of February. Yeah, 14 of February. It was for me. It was just a school day. I'm waking up at 7 a.m. and going to school. And I saw people in the street cheering, like uh, it's the city cert. Uh, they were cheering for Gaddafi. They were cheering for the for uh, the social uh, the socialist Libya. They were supporting their their leader. And I was like, why? Why are they going on the street cheering for it? What's happening? What's happening in the moment? And I went to school, and the school they said to us, uh, "We're gonna go to a marsh, like we're gonna go to the green square in the city. Uh, we're gonna like uh, cheer and support our leader." And all the kids were like, "Yeah, of course, we gotta cheer for our leader. Like Gaddafi for us is like a symbol. Uh, you can't even you can't even at that time you can't even say you can't just say like yeah, I had a I had a weird incident when." Uh, uh, we are classmates. The teacher said to us, "Just Amr um, Gaddafi." She didn't say "Leader Mama Gaddafi," and we're like, "All the kids were annoyed, like by her, because she why she didn't say leader Mama Gaddafi?" Uh, we're like seeing him as a role model for us. Like he, that's a red line you can't cross for us because that's how we thought and how, that's how uh, we saw and how our fathers and their fathers lived and how he how he made their life better and how we now have a house we live in we have a car we have we have a free health care we have uh, almost free electricity and we have a gas price which is pennies it's nothing for us we can buy bread with just a quarter we can we can buy eight uh, eight uh, uh, eight pairs of bread just with one quarter so for us it was a blessing we lived in uh, so yeah, at that time uh, the war happened, started happening. Things were escalating fast. Uh, uh, we were really new to the situation. We we're scared. What's going on with the country? Because we were watching, we were watching Libyan national TV, and uh, we had um, uh, Libya as a, a more a more a close society. So you have we have our cousins. And the fast east of Libya, and have our cousins in the fast west, like in Tripoli and and Benghazi. We saw things escalate in Benghazi. And we were talking to our cousins in Benghazi and everything, and they're saying to us, "What's happening?" So what was happening? How what happened? Um, uh, and Benghazi started as a small protest uh, protests from the start of February uh, because of the. Uh, Abu Salim prison case. That's the this one one of the reasons that protests happened. Uh, so Abu, Abu Salim uh, prison case happened. Uh, I think in the eighties. It was they said the uh, the Libyan opposition in the UK uh, said there was one thousand two hundred prisoners killed by the government at that time. It was a rumor going on from the 80s till to the uh, till, uh, to the 2000s, but the actual number I think it was between 150 to 200 prisoners. But and uh, uh, the the protest uh, the protesters were happened. It was the families of the victims who died in the prison. Uh, it was uh, around 12 to 13 families uh, with their lawyer. And that government and the government that at uh, the time were trying to make arrangements with them to confiscate them for uh, for the their loved ones who 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 died. And they got to the arrangement of one million uh, Libyan dinar, and the lawyer was saying like, "I want high, I want high. No, we want high, we want high." Then the media started focusing in this case. Then led to other stuff. It was escalating. Step by step, step by step, step by step. We're gonna go to post after NATO intervention. What uh, what intrigued the Muslim case because it was all uh, propaganda. The the full story, the official story, is the true story. Because 
uh, the official story is oh, Pusilim uh, prison is known for holding terrorist groups ideology like their ideology is uh, terrorism from the start from the 80s trying to uh, overthrow the government trying to kill people in the east trying to blow the port of Mangazi uh, they were supported uh, one time they were supported by the, the French one time they were supported by the US one time they were supported uh, by the UK and we all we all knew these cases and we all knew they were like supported by countries and they, they showed them in the TV confessing that they were supported by other countries. So why are they making a big uh, deal of it? Uh, okay, what, what happened in the prison? In the prison that these, uh, that's, uh, these uh, uh, terrorist groups tried to overthrow the prison guards. They killed one prisoner guard. They sliced them up in the meaning way. They cut off his head. They start cutting his hands and feet. Then the government ha had to intervene, had to shoot, had to shoot uh, life bullets so the riot in the prison doesn't come out. Because you had one of the most dangerous people in the country in that prison. You had, uh, for, you had members of Al Qaeda. You had members of, uh, you had members of spies. You had members of people who were trying to overthrow the government. You have members of the military men who sell out. They were supported by the West. They were trying to uh, do a conflict between the insides of the uh, the military. So yeah, that case they 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 really focused in it in the the first uh, weeks of uh, the so-called uh, revolution. Then things got out of hand. Things got out of hand when uh, I think the orders were coming even. Uh, uh, Mustafa Abdeljidu, which uh, which was the head council of the uh, Libyan, uh, the other Libyan government, or or was in the revolution, uh, uh, he was appointed by the UK and the French and uh, the US as the head of that government in uh, 2011. He said that the orders were coming from Gaddafi that no usage of power against the people, don't use bullets, be peaceful with all of them, don't. Don't come near them. So, okay, that protest were going larger and larger and larger and going into the military bases, the police stations, and uh, and all these sensitive places in, in, in the West, in Benghazi. What happened at that time? Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the military men had orders not to shoot anything. The policemen, they had orders just use, use peaceful measures. But the people and the protesters were not all peaceful. The vast majority was, were, were peaceful. The first victim we saw was uh, uh, Hisham Shushan. I have, him, I have him in my Twitter. Uh, he was a Libyan uh, uh, soldier. He was, uh, he was uh, from the south of Libya. He was working uh, in Baghazi. They just saw him, and the media was saying there were mercenaries, and they just saw him. They hanged him in the police station, and they cut off his head while screaming like "Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar," while uh, like while cutting his head off. That uh, we saw that in the national TV, but the media at that time, the uh, the Western media and the Arab media didn't show it. We saw from the first start that for these protests are not peaceful. These people are not Libyan. These people are. Uh, are, are like terrorists in the sense of a way, like because uh, there were no peaceful process of uh, protest because you're going into Libyans, calling them mercenaries, and you're just cutting them off. And you and you and you knew him because he was saying in the video, he was saying, "I'm Libyan, guys. I'm Libyan. I'm Libyan." They were cutting his head off. Like, what kind of way? I think may uh, you can, uh, protest can get violent and stuff, but cutting his head off—that's a that's a method is supported by ideology, extremist ideology. So you got to know how these protests happened, how it led to that. So yeah, uh, people were overthrowing the police stations, not facing any, not facing any force. Uh, they were, took over military bases, not facing any force, and that happened. They took over the guns, artillery, and the and the and the cities of Benghazi, Beda, Tobruk. 
uh, vast ma major cities in the east of Libya. <laughs> and things uh, got out of hand at that time. Uh, the uh, my, vast majority of the east of Libya fell uh, from, from the borders with Egypt to Lishdabia, which is between, uh, we are inserted in the, in the middle of Libya. Dabia is like 400, uh, 300 kilometers away from Sirte. So uh, they had the guns, they had, they had the ammo, they had the artillery, and they were coming forward uh, to the, the west more and more. That time, uh, 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 I'm sorry for uh, skipping this. Sif al-Islam made a speech in the 20th of February uh, before the east of Libya fell. Uh, he made the speech, a long speech, an hour-long speech. He explained to the Libyans what overthrowing the government is, what these, what these violent pro protesting is, what's what's gonna do to the Libyans. We call it uh, we, for Libyans. Uh, we call that speech as a for for sighting, because everything he said in that one-hour speech happened word by word. Didn't happen immediately, but happened over the years. The oil prices, the healthcare, the electricity, the the stopping of the projects going on the country. He said, he said, you Libyans, uh, you're not like Tunis and Egypt. You're a tribal society. You know that, like you, you have to know your history. We had a conflict of a tribal, we had wars, uh, tribal wars for, for many, many years. Uh, in, in the 20s and the 30s, we had, we had tribal wars in the 40s. We had tribal for, uh, wars in the 1800s. So you Libyans, you have to understand, this is not like Tunis and Egypt. This is not a revolution. Uh, these ma mass media companies and billions and billions of dollars going on against you Libyan, against your projects, against your 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 declaring of African Union, African currency, your higher projects for the future, for the liberation, just not for Libyans, for the all of people, for the people from Africa to Latin America, to Asia, to Europe. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a bigger, it's a much uh, bigger deal than peaceful protest and you want uh, housing or uh, better wages because he offered to them in, in the 20th, of February, because Saif al-Islam was the closest to the younger people, he was the closest with the, the project, he offered to them, he said to them, if we stop the violence now, we're going to make a constitution, we're going to change, even if you guys don't like the way uh, uh, the social the social Libya work, we're going to change it, we're going to choose a flag, we're going to choose an anthem, we can all sit at a table and choose that without no intervention. <coughs> <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> he said that uh, he said that in his speech, he said it's the Libyans for an hour, but from that time, mass media were cutting off uh, uh, videos of the speech out of context. Uh, they never showed the whole speech. Uh, they were just increasing the violence, the need of violence, the need of violence, the need more support, the need of intervention, more intervention, Western intervention. Now Libyans know it's the, they know it as the, uh, the, 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 the speech that told the future. Everyone like sees this, this speech as a, as a stone that Libyans go into every time they see something happen horribly in the country after the, the NATO intervention, they go into the speech. So yeah, uh, the worst uh, continued until until the 18th of March. So the 19th of March is the clearing of the, uh, uh, the NATO intervention, no fly zone. 18th of March, the Libyan army declared the liberation of the, the East, the, the, the process of the military operation in the East after Gaddafi's speech, after he said revolution of revolution two times, after he explained to the Libyans what they have, what they're gonna go, uh, what is this war is, what's their 
uh, what's their history or the tribal history. He called every tribe by name. Gaddafi was really uh, was really intelligent in the tribal community of Libya. He knew every tribal chief in the country, every tribal family. He knew every family by name. See, he was, he was calling them in every city. He was calling the tribe of this family, tribe of this family, the tribe of this family. How you do this? Your history comes from that and that, that and that. Your history comes from that and that and that. He, he was really knowledgeable about the society in Libya in that uh, aspect. Uh, so yeah, the, milita the military started marching to uh, Mangazi to the to the east uh, while they were marching. I had my cousins there in the, that march. I had uh, of my uncles there because they were military men. Then we heard, we saw the, we saw the NATO declaring no fly zone. We didn't know because we saw it as a no fly zone at first. So there were not gonna, not gonna be no planes, but the marching for the military was going on. So we were celebrating. Uh, and the cities of Tripoli and the uh, um, vast majority of the, the West, maybe not Masrata and Zatanda, and that these cities were under the, uh, the, the war at that time. Uh, but we were celebrating uh, the marching liberation because we saw in the TV for us, we saw, we saw our cousins, we saw other tribal members we knew, we, we saw people uh, like familiar with us. Going into the, going into the east, liberating from the, all these thugs we saw in the news, killing people and slaughtering them. Things we never saw, we never saw in our society. Things we never mentioned, we never imagined that would happen to our country. Then, uh, and uh, we were uh, we were in a protest in the airport here in Sirte, and we were coming back from the that protest uh, and supporting the, the marching of the military, when we saw the Tomahawk missiles hitting the, air, uh, the, the airport where we were in like just 30 minutes before, it was so horrifying for us at that time. We didn't understand what's going on. Why the Tomahawk missiles, why, uh, why, the, why they're hitting the airports, why they, they're hitting the military camps at that time. And then the intervention started. The marching of the military stopped. A lot of people died. They wiped out the whole. Uh, I think a vast majority of that, of that, uh, that power were, were, were going to the, to the east. So they cleared the whole path for them. They cleared the whole path for uh, the terrorist rebels. So yeah, after that the war really then started escalating. Uh, uh, it was on and off, on and off, on and off, liberating uh, cities, then taking it from the NATO intervening, people dying a lot, a lot of our cousins uh, being killed by NATO bombs. Uh, a lot of families we saw uh, getting bombed, their houses getting bombed, a lot of buildings getting bombed. Every day there was a new bombing. Every every day, NATO were killing civilians in Tripoli and Sirte, in other uh, cities in Libya. Every day we saw this, and the mass media wasn't showing any side of it. I think just the one channel I saw just forcing of these mass uh, mass bombings of cities and showing the kids how they died and stuff it was like Russia Today. That's the only channel I can remember that showed that at that time. No other channel even mentioned it. Even when NATO commander at that time said we hit a civilian target in Zlitin, uh, where they hit eight houses, eight civilian houses. They killed more than 20, uh, 21 people in eight houses. And as they said, just uh, collateral damage. Uh, we didn't mean it. And we saw these things happen in front of our eyes. We were just living life while getting bombed. In any second you can get bombed and die, uh, not, nothing will happen. No one will, will hear you. So yeah, until, uh, until uh, 
uh, Tripoli fell. And that happened because of NATO and treason, uh, treason of one of the big commanders in the military. Uh, and also NATO bombing Tripoli with uh, 160 rockets the night before uh, Tripoli fell. That was a whole massacre. A lot of people died in Tripoli. A lot of people died. There were a lot of African supporters. Africans came from Africa supporting, protesting. They were all killed immediately after Tripoli fell because they were just African. We called them mercenaries, but we know them. Uh, we saw a lot of them marching for us in the Green Square in Tripoli, supporting the government. They were not holding arms. They were just Africans working in Libya, loving Libya. When they killed them, all of them, it was, there was uh, two massacres that happened in Tripoli. It was the, uh, the hospital of Busli massacre, and there was like the hospital of uh, Al Khadra massacre also. They killed every wounded person, women, uh, men, anyone who was, were near the tents where they were standing and cheering for the government or supporting the government, they killed them all. Uh, uh, after that, Tripoli fell. For me personally, me, I finally went back to Sirte, uh, then started the siege of Sirte, the last standing place of uh, Gaddafi. We were uh, surrounded for two months uh, uh, without, uh, without no food. We were just high water and, uh, and uh, closed packets of food that were stored like uh, three, four months ago. Uh, and we were sieged for two months. We get a, the city was getting bombed heavily for two months uh, by NATO. NATO bombed two schools. They, they bombed a hospital. Uh, at that time, they killed a lot of civilians. We saw a lot of our neighbors uh, die at that time. And no mass, no media coverage at all. We we're surrounded by all areas. Uh, it was shelling 24 hours. From the east, the south, the uh, the west, because city is a uh, city. Uh, the city surroundings were high, and the city was down uh, more uh, close to the sea. So they're all putting their uh, their guns, their houses, uh, and NATO was going surrounding the area twenty four hours bombing, and they were all shelling the city until we got out of city uh, and Gaddafi uh, uh, died as a mortar because we know he died a hero, like he said in his in speech uh, before, uh, before the NATO intervention, he said his, his grandfather died in Libya fighting the Italians. He's gonna die fighting the West, the Libya also, because he's not gonna leave uh, the countries, the country. Then uh, the, uh, the government fell. Because the, uh, the famous speech of the head of the new government council saying, uh, uh, not not saying oh Libyans are equal now the liberation is going on. He said yes now for every Libyan can marry four wives. He said that as the declaration of liberation after Gaddafi fell. He never he didn't say oh, now we're equal now there's the new prospect of liberty nothing. He said now Libyans can marry four wives because you know the the mindset of people were putting under control at that time. So yeah, uh, uh, the government fell. 2012 was really hard for us as a Gaddafi supporter. Uh, as, as Libyans, uh, we're more, vastly the majority. Gaddafi supporter was really hard for us. You can't go out to certain places. You can't say even your tribe because there's tribes are uh, supporting Gaddafi from the start. Like my tribe, is yeah, is the same th uh, the same tribe as Gaddafi, so for us, even seeing your name can get you uh, in jail or uh, murdered at that time from 2012, 2013, or 14. It was it was uh, we moved to another city. We lived under uh, we lived under a new name for the first year because no one knows us. But we were saying we were just from that city. We couldn't, we couldn't say any tribe or something like that because it was going uh hunting for any any people that were supporting the government before it fell uh in 2012 and the prisons alone there were more than 30 uh, 30 000 prisoners well i can't say even prisoners 
because they were uh, lawfully uh, prisoners. They were just capturing them, civilians, military men, anyone capturing them without no court, without no justice system. They were killing uh, They wiped out the whole city of Tawarga, which is near Masrata, which is vastly, uh, vastly black Libyans. They wiped out the whole city. They cleared it out of people. They destroyed their homes, everything, and they killed their any young man who could even give them the sense he could fight or fought during the war. They killed them. They imprisoned them. I had uh, had three of my uncles in prison. Uh, vast majority of the war uh, after uh, the government fell from 2011, 2016, and 17, they told us about the torture they went to. They were boiling people alive. There were videos on YouTube about them boiling people alive because of their their skin color, because of their their from that city and that tribe. And uh, yeah, from 2012. Uh, I don't think Libyans still know how it feel, or like how the outcome of the the war was. It was still stable. The government were after that were just stealing a lot of money, which is was the Gaddafi's government uh, was keeping it saving for infrastructure and uh, and uh, uh, the, and supporting the currency and stuff like that. They were just spending, spending, spending a lot of money the things started to really fall down uh, in 2000, after 2013 because 2012 was, for them, it was like, oh, elections, we're going to do elections. Oh, we're going to be a democratic party and stuff like that. But I think they got the sense of it from 2013. Uh, after, uh, this is, uh, after killing the, the U.S. ambassador and after... Uh, these rebel groups that they supported, uh, well, Hillary, uh, Hillary Clinton said, she said, in a, I think she said in her book that uh, they were extremists, but we supported them and that caused then the like uh, lead to the outcome of the US ambassador getting killed. So they support these terrorist groups, they funded them during the war and then they were taking control of Mangazi in the East. So in 2013, the start of the assassination started. 146 military and policemen were assassinated by these terrorist groups in Benghazi, uh, by groups by Ansar Sharia and ISIS groups and former Al Qaeda members in the east. So things, Libya now they got the sense. So ah, uh, there's there's something going on. Uh, th this is not this is not what they told us. Uh, uh, I'm talking about Libyans who supported the so-called revolution. Or they got, they supported that they believed in the lies. They were saying, they were seeing people getting killed every every day, assassinated, and they were seeing the flags of Al Qaeda in the mid city of Benghazi like flying up. And they were like, ah, oh, these are not our uh, young springs of the revolution. who were like smiley and they were joyful and they were loving us and they were like fighting for our freedom. No, they're actually. Uh, uh, born and raised in Afghanistan, in, uh, in Kabul. <laughs> uh, they were seeing, uh, uh, they were seeing former uh, Bin Laden, uh, Bin Laden uh, friends, uh, uh, stuff like that. So uh, yeah, the assassination started 2013. Bombings, uh, suicidal bombers going on. Then the currency going down. The currency, the, the currency was. Uh, Majority of Libyans know the currency was one dollar equals one dinar and fifteen cent. It was really one of the. Uh, I think it was at that time before the war was the most powerful currency in Africa, depending to the, to the dollar. But now the currency is going higher. It's two dinars, three dinars, four dinars, five dinars. Electricity going down. Electricity going down for fourteen hours, sixteen hours a day. Two. There is no money in the banks. No one, how prices going up. Nothing's now at the pop of first. 2014, a war in Tripoli. The airport got burned. Militias are fighting each other. 
the, 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 the rebel brothers who are like fighting along, now fighting each other because they're, uh, they're fighting over power. Who's going to take care of what? Who's, who's, going to, who's going to steal this? Who's going to steal that? I'm going to take the airport. You're going to take that ministry. You've got to take that ministry. And that time, for us as Gaddafi supporters, like, uh, we were like, things, things didn't come out the time was. We, were, uh, uh, we predicted everything was going to happen and happened. Now we were in the right, we chose the right part of history. We chose, uh, we didn't, we didn't sell out our country because we've seen U.S. Marines abducting a Libyan citizen, even if he, if, even if he was an extremist, uh, abducting him from the, uh, in the middle capital of Tripoli in the middle of the night and taking him to Guantanamo base. They would never do that. And when Gaddafi was in power, a U.S. Marine going into the, Tripoli abducting Libyan citizen. Uh, but we, we were seeing that. And we were seeing governments steal a lot of money. We've seen governments spending 14 billion on on uh, on uh, desks. Uh, there was a government that spent 14 billion on desks, just desks for uh, ministries. Uh, uh, we saw wars going on in Tripoli a lot more. We saw the massacre of Barwur. Uh, which is like a lot of people died because they were just protesting against, against the militias. Uh, we saw the assassinations going higher and higher in the East. Uh, we saw in a war going on with Al Qaeda members. We saw people so, uh, supporting Al Qaeda members. Uh, then we saw the rise of ISIS in, uh, in CERT here, our, my city. My city was controlled by ISIS for a long time. And we saw them. Uh, but, the, so, but the rise of ISIS didn't happen just in 2016 or 15. It happened from the beginning in 2011. The people who, who got into CERT and supported by NATO, was, they were the most wanted by the government. They were the people who fought in Afghanistan, people who fought in Iraq. They were known. They were uh, about, uh, like uh, faster names that we know that they were legit terrorists. Uh, wanted by a lot of countries. They're the ones who got into the city in 2011 during the war. But they stayed here. They stayed under a different name. They start growing. They start getting supporter, supporters oh, during the years, during the years, during the years. Then they, they, uh, they declared the state of Islam uh, uh, ISIS here in the city. And, uh, and the, the city was controlled by ISIS. We're seeing Tunisians, Afghanis, uh, uh, Egyptians, we're seeing Somalis, we're seeing these all different nationalities in our city, people beheading, getting beheaded in the streets, the people be, uh, being, uh, uh, being whipped, the people, uh, even if they call you smoking, you're gonna get killed. Even if they call you wearing shorts, you're gonna get kidnapped. Like now, like, at that time, it's like, it was just like, well, even, even, even the people who supported the so-called revolution were like, what do we have done? What did we have done? What did we have? What did we lose? How much of real freedom we lost? Because at that time, I was talking to my friend who, was, who, was, uh, who supported the, the so-called revolution in 2011. But he became real to me because he said, now we're in 2015 during ISIS time. He said to me, what did we lose? Now we can go even wearing shorts when we had uh, women, fly, uh, women uh, flying airplanes in the 70s and the 80s. We were like women, we're, we're ministers. And we had we the... Had, uh, equal rights for women and men. We had equal rights for everybody. We had freedom. We had, we had everything we wanted. Well, now we were controlled by a bunch, of, a bunch of extremists in our own country. In our own country, we can't, we can't even say nothing. And that what happened. 2017 got worse a lot. 2018. 2019, 2021, then the, uh, in 2019, the war between Haftar and Tripoli, 
uh, between the council there, uh, people are dying. You see massacres every day going on in the south during even during Ramadan, even during Ramadan, and in the, in, in the city where I used to live after I moved from from Sirt to that city during Ramadan, there were like eighty people died in Ramadan just because of uh, just because of uh, people stealing, the militias going on. Uh, you can't go out at night after seven a.m. When you're in a country, when you can travel by car from the from the borders with Egypt to the borders with Tunisia, no one's gonna bother you. It was safe, one hundred percent. You can, uh, for us Libyans, we had that we had the uh, idea. You can leave your uh, door open. You would never shut it down. We would we would never shut our door like before the war. Our door, our house door was always open. Now you can't even go after 7 a.m. You can't go out of your house because you got to get scared of your life. You, can, you can't. You have a higher percentage of, of getting killed. So the destruction of the government, the healthcare system, which is now, which is now, uh, which is now, is now so destroyed. When you go to, into a hospital now, a public hospital, you have to buy stuff from the pharmacy before you go. You have to, to buy the syringes. You have to buy the tissues. You have to buy the medicine before you go to the hospital itself because they don't have nothing. The hospital itself can have nothing. Or you're in the summertime, you have four or five days without electricity, a whole blackout in the whole country. When your country is producing one million barrels of oil, and you don't have electricity, and you don't have you don't have goods that are supported by government. Now it's really, really expensive expensive for the vast majority of Libyans. They can't you can they can't buy it. You have twenty percent living in camps between Tripoli and the east, Malazi. You have a lot of a lot of people under the line of poverty, really. Because that's what I was gonna say. That's why I talked about before the revolution. We got from a stage to 50 years back or 60 years back. We didn't start, we got we we started we started with the 50s. We got to the 50s, we got back to the 50s. We got back to this the 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 stage where where UN would just be a charity for us and feed Libyans. Like we got to the back to the stage. Why well, I started with the fifties because we got back to the stage, that stage. Libyans got back to the stage that they never experienced. The younger generation never experienced. They got back to it because they saw it. When you're a country and uh, rich with oil, now it's, they're talking about oil. Oil you want to be like Dubai, and now you don't even have the the, the simple needs of electricity, and uh, and healthcare and the education system and goods for supported by the government because you would buy them. You don't have all of these, necess you don't have all the necessary things. You're, you live in, they, they really sent us back to the stone age. In the, in the very ex existence of the stone age, I, like, it's, it's so horrible. It's even worse in reality, I swear. For us, for me, for, for the people I know, how they lived before the war and after the war, it's for us. It's really, really horrifying. Even the change of the, it was so horrifying. The Libyans, it's uh, Libyans themselves changed psychologically. They changed their attitude, changed their ways, changed. They're not as before. They're becoming more savage in their own of life. Like because when you get to the point as a tribal society, and you go to that stage of flawlessness, there is no law, tribes are gonna go scavenge for their food. That's why now we have tribes supporting one party, tribes supporting another party, because they see their benefit with that party. So we got back to a stage to their tribalism is like working with basic needs. We have our needs with this party, we're going to go with this party. We have our needs with this party, we're going to go to this party. Because of the lawlessness, because there is no system in the country, there is no government. It's a shell government. It's a puppet government. They can't even, they can't even make 
orders of himself. Uh, an ambassador, UK ambassador, can do much more work in Libya than the head of the government. Like, that's, we got back to the 50s where really ambassadors were controlling over the country. Ambassadors, just having the more freedom than most of Libyans. Where, where, uh, where before the war, the U.S. ambassador had had to take had to take permission to get out of uh, ten yards out of the, the 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 embassy in Tripoli. They were taking permissions uh, permission from the government in 2010 to just get out of ten yards of the embassy because it was national security. You can't go out of the embassy without without a permission. Now we have an uh, ambassador that can go from the far east to the west, solving Libyan issues. What was a, what an ambassador has to do with Libyan issues and uh, talking about politics and the government and stuff. You're an ambassador. Why, why are you getting yourself involved in that? So they, they met it as a shell country. They got it back into a shell country like the 50s. No one is in control, nothing. And uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's the whole summary of the Libyan, the Libyan, uh, history, I think, what I saw and what I think it is, and what we experienced, vast majority of Libyans just accept the uh, people who benefit from the war, people who benefit from the suffering, people who benefit from the chaos, because you're always going to have people benefiting from all these reasons and supporting the chaos going on further and further. Well, thank you so much for that was an incredibly comprehensive, detailed uh, experience of everything that happened. And uh, I just have a couple more kind of questions to hear a little bit more about what it was like. So for one thing, you talked about the NATO intervention. Um, yeah. A lot of people have been have been coming back to just how important that was that NATO took this global yeah. role and, you know, intervened on behalf of preserving uh, Western imperialism in Libya. Um, yeah. Can you talk about the, the NATO bombing campaign, the no-fly zone in particular, and just how much damage it caused to Libya? Okay. Uh, uh, so when NATO bombings happened, I was, I was in, in the city of Sirte. Uh They first bombed, uh, uh, like I said, uh, airports and military uh, camps. Then they shifted. Then they shifted their strategy a little bit because that wasn't efficient for them. They started uh, uh, bombing uh, ministry ministry buildings, or like office buildings, killing uh, uh, killing employees of Ministry of Education, Ministry of Justice. Uh, 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 then they shifted more. They started bombing uh, schools and hospitals because it was a legit target for them. I don't know why. What I saw in Tripoli, uh, uh, and that time I uh, moved from Sir to Tripoli in April, the, the, the bombings weren't just like targeted at a specific place. It was random, I swear. And, that's, and one time it was just random. Any, any place could be targeted. Houses, farms. Uh, buildings, school, hospitals. It could be anything because in TV, they never showed uh, anyone, any other media showed. In our TV, national TV, we saw a family getting bombed in, in the midst of, uh, midst of Tripoli, Sugjima, which is the, the, the biggest central uh, part of Tripoli, which is like get a family getting bombed in their house and six people getting killed, babies lifting out of the wreckage of uh, bombings. What do you hear from NATO? Nothing. There's no explanation why you guys bail bomb this house. Nothing. It's a, it's a neighborhood. It's a, res a residential uh, area. There's no military camps around. There is no military men around. Why are you bombing houses? We saw one of the most horrifying massacres that happened is the, uh, the house of... Uh, uh, a lieutenant uh, Hueldi, which is he was a, a big lieutenant in the army, but he retired a long time ago, even before the war. They bombed his house. They bombed his house 
and they killed 14 people. Uh, six of them, he, they were the sons of his, uh, uh, they, they were the sons of uh, his son. Like uh, it was the, their grandfather's house. They were babies. There were six children, just babies, lifting them out of the wreckage. They bombed the civilian house. They said, for them, they said, it was a big uh, lieutenant in the army. We bombed their house. But it was a civilian house. You didn't bomb a, a military camp. You bombed the civilian house. There, was, there were families in there. You bombed them. You killed them. The Libyans saw this. We saw this in the news. We were like, how people... How they're so heartless. How, how they didn't feel about us. And, and, and the crazy thing that we, we no one know about the, these things. After the war, no one know about these things, about these bombings of people getting killed by NATO. Because vast majority of people outside of Libya seem like NATO, just no fly zone, that's it. They're bombing tanks, they're bombing military, that's it. They didn't see... They're bombing houses, building hospitals and schools. And then we had the massacre of Zlitin, which I saw, I told you, more than one house, more than uh, in one house. That's the only massacre they acknowledged and said it was a mistake, it was collateral damage. After big news were dragged out of the Rexis Hotel, out of the Rexis Hotel, big news were dragged out of, out of there and getting to the to the to place in another city, seeing like these houses are got bombed. A lot of people die, 21, 21 in exact, children, women mostly. They were just living in their houses. They just got bombed. They were in a residential area. There were, it, was, it was a peaceful city. There was no war going on in this city. It was a small city. Why did they bomb these, uh, these houses? No explanation also. We had, we had uh, the bombings of... Uh, 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 which is uh, uh, where Gaddafi lives, but it's a big, it's a big, it's a big, uh, it's a big residential uh, residential area, also with a military military camp. But people at that time were going into uh, that area, protesting, supporting the government. There were people camping there. There were people sleeping there. There were people eating there. They bombed them. They bombed the protests going on there at the middle of the night. They killed a lot of people there. They didn't bomb the house of Gaddafi. They didn't bomb the military. They bombed the protest itself was going on there because people were going on there cheering and supporting their leader. They bombed them just to make them scared. Uh, what else? Uh, they bombed uh, in the first month uh, of the intervention. They bombed, uh, they bombed the farm in Tajura. It's, it's a near military camp. They killed six people there. Uh, it was collateral damage for them also. And a siege, the siege of CERT. When we were like in CERT and we were besieged by all these different groups and we were like in the city for two months. We saw a lot of people getting killed by bombings. They, they bombed the radio station. There was two people killed there. They bombed the hospital at Bencina. It was, they bombed the, the outside office, the outside office. But when you bomb an outside office just near the hospital, when there's like people wounded every day because of the shelling, you you caused a lot of people dying because the half of the hospital was gone. The the second flooring and the third flooring was almost wiped out. A lot of people died because they were in the they were in the in, uh, sensitive care. They were uh, doing surgeries and they bombed an office building near that. They caused a lot of people dying in that area. Uh, I have a personal story, if you don't mind me tell, uh, I don't, if you don't uh, telling about a bombing. Uh, it's uh, our cousins. Uh, their uh, their grandfather is the, is uh, the lieutenant uh, in the army. He's uh, when they bombed his house here in Sir during the siege. Uh, two of my cousins passed away in that bombing. They bombed the house, resi a residential house. It had a lot of families because they were, and the shelling, when you were sieging a, a city, there was shelling from everywhere, 24 hours. A lot of families going to go into one house because they want to stay together. And they bombed the house. 
they also tried to bomb another house, Mansour Dawood, which is like the head general in Tripoli. He was captured and he's still held prisoner. They bombed that house, but thank, thank God that that bomb, that bomb didn't explode. It went straight from the roof to the first floor, but didn't ex explode. But that house had eight families in it. Eight families in it. And didn't explode. They were just targeting persons, people, exact people and that when the city was surrounded there were exact people there were people on the ground giving them giving them details and they were responsible of the blood spill of a lot a lot of libyans they were responsible for that and uh what, what other bombing happened yeah there was uh, another bombing uh and the first uh weeks of uh uh uh, war in Sirt here. A lot of families were trying to go out of Sirt uh, uh, to the to the east. Uh, no, to the west. There was like a long line of cars going on out of the city. They bombed the cars because they thought it was like a military convoy. They were just people going in lines with a lot of cars going out of the city because they want to follow each other. They want to go alone. No one's going to go alone while the city is getting shelled. So there was a lot of civilian cars going out of the city. They bombed them. So how many, like, how many things that happened in, in, in things they knew and they didn't know, and they just didn't care. They didn't give a damn about all the lives of these people who died just because they were just targeting, because they were just targeting uh, Gaddafi, because they're protecting civilians like they did, you could have been truthful. And they said, we're targeting Gaddafi from the start. No fly zone bullshit. No, no civilians. We're trying to protect civilians because you killed more civilians because of it than you did before in the intervention. You didn't stop the war. You didn't stop the killings of Libyans. But your intervention led to the dying to a lot, a lot of people. Even before, like even before, compared to but before the intervention, would the big scale more because before the intervention, the people who died in Mangazi in the first week there were just 12, 12 people died. That's it from both parties. There was twelve. And post intervention, that was thing was go to thousands. The last estimate, uh, I think it was before Tripoli fell, from civilians and military men went up to 40,000 because of the NATO intervention because they were just bombing anything they were just going on mad madness bombing anything could move anything that would move we would bomb so yeah that's that's what I like I saw it during uh, that time and well uh, NATO intervention uh, like what they did and how they bombed what their strategy was Uh, I'm so sorry to hear um, everything everything you said. And I mean, it's a, it's an unbelievable atrocity committed um, yeah. by NATO and by the U.S. Uh, I'm curious also about the reactions today. Like you know, after some time has passed, and and was that a the status of the the civil war itself too? Like what's been happening recently? Uh, between between Haftar and the uh, government of National Accord, um, and then also, mm. you know, with with Libyans today, their reflections on everything that happened, how much, you know, regret is there for, like you were talking about, you know, your friend saying his regret for supporting <laughs> the the so called revolution, how much, uh, you know, missing Gaddafi and and regretting that this. NATO intervention happened and uh, and overthrew him. So I guess yeah, the you know what what's happening now uh, in Libya. Uh, so after after the war ended between Haftar and the National Accord in 2020, uh, then they did the uh, the Geneva meeting and they declared a new government. Uh, uh, and Beta which is the head of the new government, came, took power, and he declared a lot of stuff he didn't do. He declared uh, 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 
peace agreements between all parties, uh, between Libyans from all sides. And he, he stated that all, all people are going to live more safer now. We're going to help the country prosper again. We're going to start the projects that stopped in 2011. We're going to we're going to uh, build them uh, again. We're going to start that and that and that. Uh, but of course, that didn't happen. Uh, the government sh should have stopped at uh, at, this, at December last year because there were has, had to be elections. It should have been October, but they, they then they rescheduled to December, but it should have ended at December. That's it. The government failed to do what it that or just had to, to go to elections and let people uh, elect their president and their government. Of course, they couldn't do it. The, 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 so the, the road to elections was going, we're going to do elections from June, like the people were signing up or going out, registering. And the big side was the, the Libyans would support safe Islam. Because they saw, they see him as as a savior for the country, as the the one party that didn't get his hand spilled in blood. So the road to that started with people registering for elections, seeing really high numbers of Libyans going on, because they saw they saw they saw a big shift between between the elections that happened in 2016 for uh, the parliament that no one gave a damn about it. Not a lot of Libyan registered for it. No one voted, no one gave it, uh, they never think of it. And they saw the high numbers of people going on now because Saif al-Islam attorney, Saif al-Islam, uh, 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 like uh, media that he like uh, talked to said like, we want you as supporters to go and register for elections. We want you to go to the election centers. They're going to be elections, so we want you to go in that process. We have to get this politically. We can't get it like uh, weapon wise. We can't get it as uh, we can't get it through violence. We want it to be peaceful. So yeah, a lot of lobbies were going on. We saw we saw more than one million uh, one million two hundred people register for the elections. And should the government should have stopped that October, declared the elections, and start people electing their nominees? So uh, the things shifted where Saif al Islam officially nominated himself. That's when things really got out of control and no one knew what was happening because they never expected. But he was saying it, he was saying it to us that elect me, elect me, elect me. But like, go register, go register, go register. But for them, they never believed it. They were saying like, just it's just uh, sayings. We he didn't speak. We never saw him. Uh, we didn't know if he's alive or dead, or we didn't know anything about him. And he he will he was kept hidden like really good. But when he came in the city of Sebha, which is in the south, he came out and he declared that he's going to go run for elections. He nominated himself. And that city, which is the third, the, the more the third, the third big city, uh, the big city in uh, Libya, that shifted the cards. That's they changed rules. They changed rules. They go to the court. They were saying elections can't be done now. Uh, it's not safe to do the elections now. There were there was no thing that happened like that before he nominated himself as a as a candidate. But after he nominated himself as a candidate, they know. Every poll, every poll they did social media, every poll they did, and uh, in every city, Saif al Islam won like really, really more far than any other nominee from the the, the elections. Uh, he went really far, he got 80 percent of the votes. And though they did a poll in the social media, which was like uh, had like more than two million people vote in it. And a uh, Saif al Islam won by a fast, big margin, more than uh, more than twenty, uh, more than twenty five percent than the other one. Uh, I think it was Baybad other one. Uh, and then the, the cars shifted. 
they said elections can be done. Uh, it's not safe to do elections. We can't control it. Uh, of course, the, 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 the election committee is supported by the U.S. Embassy. So, of course, we're going to see elections can be done because they know their, their, their uh, friends are not going to win. Their friends of the U.S. are not going to win. And if they let the elections go on, Safe Islam is going to take power. We don't know what Safe Islam would do. Is he gonna be? Is he gonna be pro West? Is he gonna be against West? You know, we we would know no. Or we would know. We wouldn't know. But he said when the and the press and uh, the press uh, uh, meeting with the New York Times reporter, I think he said to them, "I'm not gonna further away from my father's path." So I think that was a big statement for them. What safe Islam is. <laughs> So yeah, that shifted the cards. There were, uh, uh, they said uh, they uh, scheduled the, the the elections again and again and again. Now they said elections are not going to happen yet. It's going to be next year, and they're still going on the same path. Then the there's a lot of separations happen. Even the national the government now, which is headed by Baba. Uh, we have big parties from uh, the West. Uh, Bashar, which is was a ministry, uh, uh, he was head of a ministry in the West. He's a big role in, in the West because he's the, he's the from the city of Masrata. Masrata has had a lot of influence in Libya, politically and military wise. He went to Haftar after just two years of the war. After they just fought like for a year and a half, a lot of people died in that war. He went to Haftar and made the deal with him so he can be in power and Haftar B can be a general. And uh, they declared a new government uh, just two, uh, two months ago. They declared the new government while this government was going on in the West, still on the West. They, ne they never left. They never declared a new, uh, the government is not going to exist anymore. So that made separations. So we have a government in the East uh, supported by the parliament because the parliament is in the, in the East. And we have the government in the West, which was uh, done by the Geneva Conference and they should have done the elections and stopped. They're not, gonna, they're not gonna exist anymore. So we have two governments now. They're fighting each other politically wise now. Uh, uh, Libyans are between the chaos of two political governments and inflation now happening for the last six months, skyrocketing, like goods are being much, much higher, especially now with the war of Russia and Ukraine. And Ukraine is one of the most country we uh, take uh, wheat from for uh, when we take uh, flour from. So that thing skyrocketing prices going up a lot and and the wages are just still the same they never changed it they're still the same uh so yeah we have these parties going on haftar on one side with his uh with his west partner Bashara, and we have dweba on the uh on the other side trying to take control and they're both or trying to take control, they're both trying to say that we're the, we're the official government that the people want, and both trying to avoid elections at any cost. They're trying to avoid elections or, or eliminate Safe al Islam from the equation. Because they, when you gotta eliminate Safe al Islam, you gotta eliminate their bigger the biggest threat. Because when you have <clears throat> when you have people benefited from the war for 10 years or 11 years and they they, they started as uh, 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 young rebels supported by NATO to millionaires then billionaires now in Libya they're not going to let go of that easily they're not going to be threatened by someone who's going to take that from them we have when we have more than 150 militias in just Tripoli and they're all getting paid by the government millions and millions and millions of dollars every month they're not going to surrender that easily they're not going to say we're just going to go to elections let's say let's not take control and just 
eliminate all of us out of the equation. They're not gonna do that. So that's what, what you see. And you talked about Libyans in regret. I think we ha they had, I think most Libyans had three stages. So uh, every rebel, uh, every rebel had a uh, group head in the, after the war, after the, uh, after the war said in their media, in the Libyan media, after they, they, they took control, they said they fought against 70% of Libyans. And without NATO, they wouldn't have won anything because they know they were, that they're not, they weren't not the majority because uh, uh, the, the millions who were marching, millions, they were marching in Tripoli with the government, not in the East with the NATO. So there were always, there were always Libyans knew that the vast majority of Libyans support Gaddafi. Then we had the years of the chaos, the years of wars, civil war. That that percentage, if, even if we say thirty percent and seventy percent support Gaddafi, thirty percent support the other side, that that percentage was going higher for 80 percent, eighty five. But you always, like I said, you always gonna have that percentage because we're a small population. So you're always gonna have that percentage. People benefiting from the war, people benefiting from the chaos, people benefiting from the political parties. Or you're gonna have tribes benefiting from the situation. When you go to Haftar's tribe, they're benefiting from the situation because Haftar is their son. So the whole tribe is gonna benefit. We have a city like Masrata, which is the what they call it, the beacon for the revolution. Uh, all their sons are in the militias. All, it's all controlled by the government. The government is always controlled by Masrata from the start of the revolution to the end of the, the till now. Do not let do not let go, uh, let go, uh, go like with that easily. So you're always gonna have from. 5, 10 to 15 percent even 20 percent they're gonna always not regret because they're benefiting from this situation when they have their sons studying in the uk studying in spain and uh, and they have their families there and they have them villas buying millions and millions of dollars and they don't they don't have electricity doesn't run out because they have a big generator cost fifty thousand dollars they have uh, their friends in the oil fields and they have their the gas and they have you don't worry about it, nothing they were not gonna find them regretting because before that they were just regular citizens and now they're millionaires because of profiting from war and exploitation of people destroying the public health care destroying the public uh, education making it pri privatized 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 they got they're gonna benefit from all of that they're not gonna say we're regretting anything because if they, do, if they do care about standing, if they do care have, uh, <clears throat> if they do care about standing and having a position, uh, position in history and say like we're gonna stand up our our choice we did in two thousand eleven, why didn't they ch uh, why didn't they stand uh, with their choice uh, when they fought Haftar because that war just ended two years ago. It wasn't 11 years ago, it was just two years ago. Why are you making deals with them now? Because if it's about a standing or about a, a cause or about something you can't change, why are you making deals with Haftar while it was just your sons two years ago just died in that war and you guys making deals now? Because it's, that, 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 that doesn't make any uh, point that you guys are just going for your own benefit. That's it. You don't have a cause, you don't have a standing. But for Libyans who support Gaddafi, for us who support Libya Jamaria, we had the same standing for 11 years. We never changed. We had the same standing. We're going to support the liberation of Libya out of all foreign interference because we can't have a free country like before without a, with, a, 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 with a foreign interference. We can't have that. And that's what we stand on, what we stand on for the all 11 years. We, we, we've been fought a lot. We've been targeted a lot in any aspect of life. But people, people know better now. They, but now people got to the stage where they just want to live. They, they, 
they brought down people's dreams, Libyan, Libyan people, hope so down that Libyans now just hope I'm going to wake up. I just want to fuel, I just want to fuel my car. I hope I can find fuel. I can, I hope I can find water. I hope I can find electricity. I hope I can find money to, to get my, my son's books, uh, to buy, to buy my son's books from the black market because the government is not issued books in any time. Uh, we're going to wait for another month. Have to, I have to pay for gas a lot just from the black market because they're stealing a lot of it from the, uh, from the, com- the oil company and giving it, going to the desert and selling out the desert and uh, the black market is going on all Africa. And li- the Libyans' ho- hopes and dreams got so down that now for them, they just want to live. I just want to live. I don't want to die. I just want to feed my kids. I don't want to suffer anymore. That's, that's, that's the whole idea. Well, another thing that really strikes me with, with Gaddafi and, and thinking about his legacy as well, I mean, he's widely remembered as a, an inspirational figure across the African continent for, as you are describing before, his efforts to unite Africa, to create uh, an African currency, uh, his active participation in, in many struggles across Africa, like the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa, um, and so I, I wonder also, like, how did he help create in Libya uh, both a, a pan-Arab identity, a pan-African identity, and how has that created uh, for, you know, people who do, who do still support uh, Gaddafi's ideas and, as you were saying, this idea of anti-imperialism and independence, uh, a solidarity for struggles across the African continent, a, a broad anti-imperialism, and also help to understand that NATO intervention in Libya, you know, is a big part of, of a growing trend of, of foreign imperialism. Um, and and the, it's had huge effects across the entire African continent. For example, now in West mm-hmm. Africa and Mali, they have, you know, the huge civil war because of the NATO intervention. So yeah, if you could talk more about that and then that's my last question. Uh, can I just have two minutes? Uh, we're just gonna get some water, okay? Yeah, no problem. So your question is about, uh, uh, so your question was uh, about how Libyans uh, felt about the more uh, Arab Union uh, and the more about the African Union and how the ships went from the Arab Union to the African Union. So at first, the Arab Union, the period itself, like I said to you from the 70s, uh, 80s, and 90s, uh, uh, a lot of uh, people were uh, more driven to the Palestinian cause and what we saw. So it was a passionate thing, a more a solidar- solidarity thing with an Arab uh, an Arab country, an Arab cause, a struggle that they were born with. They were born out from the start, from generations, from the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, even the 90s, even as young as us. We were born with that solidarity with, with uh, Ben Arab and uh, for the union with Arab and uh, for the Palestinian cause, like I said, because it's the compass for us. It's the compass of all causes is the Palestinian cause. And uh, Libyans felt re- really strongly with it because uh, uh, regular uh, regular Libyan homes were uh, hosting Palestinian uh, Palestinian people. We didn't call we didn't call them refugees. We didn't call them. We didn't put them in camps like uh, they did in other countries. No, Libya uh, hosted them as a fellow citizen. Equal in rights, equal, equal in wages, equal any aspect of life. They can enjoy free health care like us, if, uh, enjoy free education like us. They can study with us. They can go with us. They can even participate in uh, political parties with us. So they never felt the, the need of thinking why we were going. 
supporting Palestine or why we were supporting the Arab Union. Even it was the simplest way decision ever, even for the least, most least educational education person in Libya. It was for them, Palestinian cause, a red line. I'm going to support it to the end. Uh, we're seeing people coming from all over the world, training in the camps, military camps in Tripoli. Uh, 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 women coming from all ac across the world, uh, training. And uh, one of the first military camps for women in Africa to fight for the Palestinian cause. Uh, so for them, it was a more genuine thing of, of uh, feeling that suffering for Palestinian cause. But I think the problem, uh, the problem was that with the African uh, switch. Because with the African switch, that's when I said it should have been the role of the government or the media, at least, to educate the people more, education system, say, like, to, so we can improve our lives. We have to, we have to create that union. As a singular country, you're not a real independent country. You can't create that independency without a, a union because you're not controlling the market. You're not controlling the very large aspects of life because you're just depending on oil. So in the, in the switch to Africa, a lot of Libyans saw it like, why are we going to Africa? Why are we not focusing here? But the real question was, we should have been going to Africa because if you don't go to Africa, these, these, these things you see in Africa is gonna affect you first because when you have your surrounding countries are unstable and uh, are controlled by the West and colonized by the West and, uh, they, and, you, and you as a liberation country supporting liberation all across the world, you're, they're not gonna let you go. They're gonna fight you. They're gonna bring that war to you because you're bringing that war to them in, in uh, uh, periods of times. So yeah, but Libyan, regular Libyans were like thinking why we're going to Africa? Why is it, why Gaddafi is going to Africa? Why is he, why he's going to a small tribe in uh, West Africa? Why is he going, why he's going to that city in, in the uh, middle of Africa? Why is he going to that village? Why he's dressing like this? Why he's dressing like that? Why he's dressing like them, but but it should have been more educational at that time. That he's he's going to that mess to to know the people because Gaddafi uh, described the African continent as tribal tribalism continent. You have you have to deal with it like the same way you deal with Libya Libyans that Gaddafi deal with Libyans. You gotta deal with Africans because more tribalism. You're gonna go and meet the heads of tribes in, uh, in uh, different uh, parts of Africa. And he's dressing like them because he's gonna give them the sense that he's with them. He's trying, to, uh, he's trying to liberate them. He's trying to prove their lives uh, economically and politically. So, so but like I, like I said, it's, 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 the, it's the education part to the regular Libyans that they didn't know. You were just focusing, they just come, come, came out of sanctions and they just like didn't know. They just wanted to focus on Libya, focus on ourselves, focus on building your own country, but you can't build your own country. Uh, uh, we're just being a singular country. You can't do that. History has shown us that we can't be, we can't be alone. We can't be alone. Uh, there is no, you're not gonna survive. We're not going to survive without union, without a belt that's going to protect you, military, economically wise. Uh, well, now Libyans know it. Now Libyans know why we're going to Africa, because we're seeing just now Egypt and Ethiopia, and uh, between the Nile and the things that's going on and stuff like that. We're seeing Israel is going into Africa a lot. When the main reason uh, the exit of Israel Africa was Gaddafi. Uh, it was the biggest reason that Israel was kicked out of Africa is Gaddafi because he fought them all, all along the way because he knew their steps in Africa is going to hold the continent back, is going to hold Africans back, 
that's going to keep them in the colonization era even further and further and further and getting exploited a lot for many years. So yeah, but like like I said, like uh, Libyans didn't know that uh, that uh, uh, that uh, like uh, that uh, switch. They didn't think of it much. They just think it's like a uh, more basic, uh, more uh, living thing that we just want to focus on ourselves. They didn't why their prospect a lot, but now they knew. Now they knew a lot. Now they know how things work. Uh, every Libyan know how things work now because they are focusing everything. Any other country was going on, and uh, and uh, how other countries handling with different situations. Uh, what's the other part of your question? Uh, sorry, uh, I'm also just curious about like the long term uh, effects of uh, Gaddafi's political theory. It, as put out in the green book in Libya today. So how is the political theory still interpreted for this uh, third universal theory and how does it apply to anti-imperialism and continuing this project of unity in Africa? Uh, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, I don't think it's, mm, uh, it's uh, contributing a lot uh, more, uh, like uh, much now. Uh, unfortunately, no. Uh, like I said, even before, like I'm not uh, particularly like known in the, in the the aspect of the theory itself. Even just on the aspect of how it was working here. Uh, but I think uh, I think in the most basic way we can say that people learned from that from the theory. From the power of the people, by the social social Libyan Jamaria, that they know that uh, these governments are fake, their uh, ruling is by their hand, that they can't uh, make their country uh, stable again, again without just Libyans Libyan solution, which is what a Libyan social Jamaria is. Libyan decided deciding their fate. Libyan deciding their uh, uh, rules, Libyan deciding their future. I uh, think in that aspect, yes, Libyans are uh, Libyans learned from that. Libyan, uh, Libyans learned that any uh, a foreign intervention is going to stop them from progressing and stop, uh, stop them from making a good government for them, make their, their country uh, rise again, be prosperous again. So in that aspect, uh, uh, yes, it it, uh, it affected them that they they're the power is the power of the people, and uh, the and who's gonna pick, uh, bring back the country like it was is is the people. No government, no no no, just one singular person. It's the people themselves. They have to get along. They have to decide their, for themselves. They have to make the rulings for themselves. They have to make the decision for themselves. They have to sit at the same table and uh, uh, with other Libyans, like they did, like they did in the conferences uh, before in the Libyan Jamaria, like they did. Uh, they sat from different uh, parts of the country. They sat in the same, and uh, the same place. They made their own. They made their own government rules. They made their own decisions, and they were uh, opposing decisions. They were agreeing on decisions. So I think that's. And that's in the way how it affected them in their daily life and how it's affecting them now that they know that they, they know they're 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 the power and they're the they're the people who can give it and who can take it that's a great answer and thank you so much um unfortunately uh, yeah. i have to i have to run but this was an incredible discussion and I, I learned a lot about oh, thank you about Libya about Gaddafi and also just the, the horror of the NATO intervention uh, and just how tragic it was um, so thank you so much I really appreciate you uh, taking you're welcome. the time you're welcome yeah uh, and you're I, welcome. I just think was, uh, was, yeah my very last yeah. thing I guess would be is, is there something that people should read to learn more like is there a book or or a source that you recommend reading to learn more about just everything you described, the, uh, the horror and the tragedy? 
Uh, unfortunately, uh, the people, uh, the people who I would say I can give, I can give, uh, they would explain the Libya situation in more detailed, more. I learned from them. I learned a lot from them. Mm. They only like uh, write in, in Arabic. They only write their articles right. in Arabic. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, I definitely have a big source in uh, in Facebook. He's called Wael Idris. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, he's a Libyan thinker. Uh, he's he's one of the few people in Libya in general who really knows the structure of the society, knows uh, what things led on and to what's the, the reasons for and uh, for what for Libya is going to have to do and what we uh, what we have to focus on. I think so that's one of the people I follow as I, and I see as a mentor for me and I follow him in the way of thinking and the way of uh, there is no imperious power is good and you have to let go of all uh, for intervention and you have to stand with any party with the rising poles against the West and against the imperialist powers, uh, you have to create that. You have to this. Uh, you have to uh, uh, disclude that homogeny that's going on with these countries controlling over uh, over Africa and Asia and Latin America. You have to stand solidarity with all revolution revolutionary groups. And solidarity uh, with people trying to fight the imperialist powers in different countries and regions in the world. So for me, that's the only person I guess I can uh, I can uh, say that he writes and talks about. There's other people, but uh, that's the thing for us. I think it's just uh, the more Libyans we talk about the situation, they're talking to fellow Libyans. They're not talking to, to outsiders. Of the of the country more, uh, yeah. But I think I uh, should just people reach out, uh, reach out. There's a lot of Libyans in Twitter. There, there's really the uh, big thanks to the Libyan socialist Jamahiri on Twitter. He's a really good guy. He's really re well informed. Uh, you can reach out to him. He can really talk about the Libyan situation far better than a lot of Libyans. That's where I was. I was so surprised that he know a lot about Libya, and uh, about Libyan social Jamaria While he's, you know, like and so yeah, it's not really hard to find the uh, Libyans you can talk to, uh, and you're gonna find the bad ones. You're gonna find the the ones that will say to you, uh, you know same things you're going to hear in the West and the same thing you're going to hear in the media because they're just going to defend their defend their um, their position at any cost, no matter what. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And uh, stay safe. Have a great rest of your uh, night. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Awesome. You had me the opportunity to speak to you. Of course. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.